Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing well out there and hanging in there. Uh, I have a couple of quick announcements to make um, before we jump into today's material. Uh, the main one being is that we are having another exam next Friday. That'll be exam three. And it'll be on chapters 7 through 9. Um, and that'll be on 5-1, uh, a week from Friday. Uh, along those lines, I will um, post some homework solutions. Uh, sorry about that. I'll get those up as soon as I can, and I will also post another study guide um, to Canvas. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that there is an updated schedule slash syllabus on Canvas. Uh, the only thing I updated on there was the schedule. I know we only have a couple of weeks left in the semester, but I thought you would like to know kind of where we're at and what we have coming up. Uh, things changed around quite a bit uh, when we went um, to remote teaching, and so I just wanted to provide you with that updated schedule. Uh, I moved some of the chapters around, and um, previously exam three was going to be on chapter seven through ten. I moved that to seven through nine. Uh, the final uh, will be on chapters 10 and 11. I don't think we'll get to 12 um, this semester, but that's okay. I think we've learned a lot about astrobiology already. So um, I think all in all, it's been a fairly successful semester, uh, things considering. All right, so um, without further ado, uh, let's jump into today's material on habitable zones and uh, Venus's climate. So I'll start off with a question for you. A planet located in the habitable zone of a star. Um, what does that mean for that planet? Go ahead and push pause and think about this for a moment on your own. All right, it turns out that the correct answer here is D. Uh, planets in the habitable zone can potentially have abundant I should say liquid water at the surface. So this habitable zone is a region around a star where a planet would receive enough sunlight that if it had the proper atmosphere, it could sustain uh, abundant liquid water at the surface. So um, yeah, let's look at that in a little more detail. Here's a picture of a star, the green zone here. This is the habitable zone. Okay, if this were the sun, then this is Earth's orbit. So we're sort of at the inner edge of our habitable zone. Um, yeah, what can we say about this? That... Um, it's not just a single line, it's, uh, well, before we move into that, let's again look at this definition. The habitable zone is a range of distances at which planets could potentially have uh, abundant liquid water at the surface. So this is a range because it depends on some other things. So... Uh, yeah, we could say that for Earth before we move on, 
um, this here. If this is the sun, uh, for the sun, this is from about 0 0.84 AU to 1.7 AU. So it's a wide range. And we'll say wide range because it depends. Sorry, it doesn't only depend on the distance to the star. Some other things play a role. Um, things like the atmosphere of the planet and um, the size of it and things like that. So we'll talk about that soon. Uh, some things I want to mention here is that being in the habitable zone is insufficient. What I mean by that is that you could be within the habitable zone and not have any liquid water at the surface. So this is no guarantee. One example of this is the moon, Earth's moon, in that it is in the habitable zone. It's at the same distance from the sun as the Earth, yet because it has no atmosphere, it has no liquid water at the surface. Uh, another thing to notice about these, or to note about these habitable zones, is that they're not a static thing. They evolve with time. Uh, stars evolve over their lifetimes. They get brighter and brighter. So stars brighten as they age. This means that this causes the habitable zone to evolve. And we'll talk about that some on Friday. Uh, as the star gets brighter, the habitable zone moves outward and it tends to get wider and wider. So we'll talk about those things on Friday. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to mention about this before I move on. Uh, I think I got it. It's really just these main three points uh, that it could potentially have liquid water. Um, being in the habitable zone is not a sufficient condition to have liquid water, and that these uh, habitable zones evolve with time. So at different ages for the solar system, different planets would have been in the habitable zone or maybe will be in, in the future. All right. So here's a writing prompt for you. Um, we're going to talk a lot about looking for life in the habitable zone, but there could be life outside of the habitable zone. And so take a moment, um, push pause, and write down some examples, either in our own solar system or elsewhere, where life could exist outside of this habitable zone. All right, so for me, what I came up with is Mars. Mars is not inside the habitable zone or right at the outer edge of it, but we know that there are pockets of subsurface liquid water um, that could support life, and this is from geologic geo, see if I can spell this morning, geologic heating. So it's getting heat from geolo ge geologic processes and not requiring the sunlight to keep the water warm. Another place we have are Europa, Ganymede, and Enceladus. These icy moons, they have global oceans, we think are partial global oceans, and that's from tidal heating. 
maybe you're seeing a pattern here that we need some heating mechanism in order to keep the water liquid when we're not in the habitable zone. Another example might be Titan, which does have um, liquid water. Um, but another thing we can look at here is that other liquids. So liquid, methane, and ethane could be the quote-unquote liquid of life for all those transport processes and the various things we've talked about. So those are three in our solar system. Uh, another one, sort of outside the solar system, are rogue planets. So these are planets that are ejected from the solar system during formation. And I don't know if you remember back to when we talked about the nebular theory and planet migration. I showed some simulations in class. And in class, uh, one of those simulations actually had a planet that got ejected from the solar system. Now, one thing about these planets, if they're ejected, is that even if they're Earth size, they can maintain a thick hydrogen atmosphere. because there's no sun there uh, to heat it up, cause it to boil away into space, and no solar wind to strip that hydrogen atmosphere off. So since they're out in the empty of space all by themselves, they can maintain these thick atmospheres, um, and then they could have potentially liquid water on them. Because these thick atmospheres would maintain any heat coming out of the planet. Now, you might ask, well, we had one and maybe from our solar system, how many of these are there? There may be billions of these in our own uh, galaxy. So uh, three examples in our own solar system where we could potentially have life outside of the habitable zone and one outside of our solar system. All right, so let's look at a sort of a case study here of a single planet, Venus. Now, Venus is not in the habitable zone. It's too hot. Um, but why is it so hot? Uh, if we moved Earth to Venus's location with our current atmosphere, it would only get 30 degrees warmer. But we know that the average Venusian temperature is 470 degrees Celsius, much, much hotter than here at Earth. So why is it so hot? Please take a moment to think about this on your own. All right, so it turns out that the correct answer here is C, that it is because of all of the carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. And so you might be asking why there is more CO2 in Venus than Earth. Well, it turns out that it's because there's no water in Venus, and so there's no CO2 cycle. And we'll look at the details of this a little bit more. Uh, I want to first comment on a couple of these other answers. Now, A is true. So this is true. It is located, and it does receive more solar energy. Um, so this is true, but doesn't directly contribute to the heat. It does indirectly, and again, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Um, 
with B, we think that it actually had the same geochemistry as Earth. And um, that's because it has a similar size and formation location. So it formed at roughly the same place in the solar nebula, and so it should have basically the same chemistry to start with. So those C is the correct answer here. Let's look at this carbon dioxide in a little more detail. All right, so we see similar geochemistry. And that's, again, because it formed in the same place, roughly the same place, and it's roughly the same size. So it should have similar chemical abundances. Although what we see is that Earth has about 100,000 times more water than Venus. So it's got much more water. And at Earth, we talked about this, that Earth's carbon dioxide is regulated by the CO2 cycle. Remember, if we get too much heat in the atmosphere, we get more rain. That rain dissolves the CO2 in the oceans. And that dissolved CO2 then gets sequestered in surface chemistry, in rocks, uh, in rocks. And so really important here, you need rain. This requires water. Now, if we look at Venus, uh, it has no CO2 cycle. And so most of the CO2 that it has is not locked up in rocks like on Earth, but it's stuck in the atmosphere. And so, again, the whole reason for this is no water, no CO2 cycle. Uh, I can't spell. All right. So, Venus is hotter because it has so much CO2 in its atmosphere and if we are comparing this to Earth, it's because it has 100,000 times less water. And so there's no CO2 cycle to sequester that CO2 into rocks and it stays in the atmosphere. There's no thermostat. So let's look at where the water went. And for that, I'm going to draw a little diagram here. So here's the surface of Venus. This is a little volcano. So volcanoes, that's where the water comes from. It comes out gassing. We've talked about that quite a bit. And as it goes up into space, we get ultraviolet radiation coming down. Maybe I should draw that in violet since I have all of these colors. So we have UV radiation from the sun coming in. And that does something. It does what's called photo disintegrates H2O into two H's plus an O. So the sunlight comes in and it breaks that water apart. So let's look at what happens to these pieces. The hydrogen slowly drifts up and it's sitting up here in the atmosphere, floating around, and then it gets lost to space. The solar wind strips it away. And so this is, remember, Venus has very slow rotation and no um, 
global magnetic field to protect it from the solar wind. And so all of that hydrogen quickly gets stripped away. The oxygen actually goes down. I mean, it takes a while, but it floats down and it reacts with the rocks uh, through chemical reactions and all of that oxygen gets trapped in the rocks. And so through these two processes, or really this process here, all of the water that comes out of the volcanoes gets broken apart by ultraviolet radiation, the hydrogen is lost to space, and the oxygen reacts with rocks and gets bound up. And over billions of years, this process can remove an ocean's worth of water over billions of years. So it is a slow process, but over um, a very long time, we can lose lots and lots and lots of water, a whole planet's worth. And there is actually some evidence of this. It's not just a theory. So if we look at the evidence of this, we see that there's a hundred times more deuterium at Venus than Earth. Now, what is deuterium? This is a hydrogen with an extra proton. And so it's heavier and is harder to strip by the solar wind. So the um, naturally occurring deuterium, we have this on Earth, and so every, I forget, one in a million or something, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but every um, certain amount of water is called heavy water, and it's made out of oxygen with deuterium. And in Earth, uh, there's no real main way to remove one of those o over the other. But on Venus, because of this process of solar wind stripping hydrogen over billions of years, the regular hydrogen is more likely to get stripped off by the solar wind than the deuterium. It's a little bit heavier, and the planet's gravity holds onto it a little bit more. And so um, over billions of years, that deuterium builds up in Venus's atmosphere. And so uh, what little bit is there uh, is enriched in deuterium. And so we can measure this. This is one of the ways we uh, looked for the loss of water at Mars. So if you want to go back and read through that chapter again, there's a little more detailed discussion of it there. All right. So now that we have the water lost and the um, CO2 building up because there's no carbon dioxide cycle, what we end up with is a runaway greenhouse effect. So the last thing we're going to do is look at that a little bit. And again, we're going to kind of do a case study here of what would happen if we moved Earth to where Venus is at. So as I said earlier, this would raise the surface temperature by about 30 degrees C. And so what we end up with here is what's called a positive feedback loop. Where with the carbon dioxide cycle, we had a negative feedback loop. If it got too warm, we had a process to cool it down. If it got too cold, we had a process to heat it up. Now in this positive feedback loop, the hotter it gets, um, the more we heat it, which makes it hotter, which makes us heat it more. And so this effect causes a greenhouse to run away out of control. So we'll look at that a little bit. 
uh, the higher temperature, because it's now 30 degrees warmer, means that we get more evaporation and warmer air can hold more water vapor. That's why when you go to a tropical place, the, the air feels thick and heavy with water because it actually has more water dissolved in it. And so that leads us to here. Uh, this is a picture of the greenhouse effect. Remember we have the radiation coming in from space and it heats up the ground that emits infrared, which tries to escape back to space, and it's slowed down because it gets absorbed over and over again. And we trap a lot of infrared in the atmosphere because it takes a very long time for it to escape back to space. And so once we have more water vapor, we end up with a higher greenhouse. So this... Um, adds more greenhouse gases is essentially what we're doing here by adding more water vapor. And then once we have these greenhouse gases, the temperature increases. And that causes us to put more water in the atmosphere. So now the eventual the water vapor further strengthens the greenhouse effect. Oops. Wrong pen there. This makes it hotter. So, and the cycle continues. So now it's hotter. Now we have more water vapor evaporating that causes a stronger greenhouse effect and makes it warmer, which causes more water to evaporate and the cycle continues on and on and on, spiraling out of control. And so the result of this would be that the oceans evaporate and the carbonate rocks uh, through the volcanoes release CO2, further strengthening the greenhouse effect. And so eventually making it hotter um, than Venus. So this is because we have the combined effect of H2O plus CO2, both greenhouse gases, making it very hot. Yikes. All right, so that in effect is the runaway greenhouse effect and why Venus is so much hotter than Earth. Uh, one of the main takeaways from this last little discussion is that um, the heat from the sun does play a role and can affect the atmospheric conditions, but it's ultimately the atmospheric conditions which set the planet's temperature. So it's really a combination of how much radiation the planet gets from the sun and what is its atmosphere like? Does it have plate tectonics? Does it have a CO2 cycle? Does it have water in its atmosphere? Uh, all of these things are important, and many of them are actually driven by the size of the planet. So we'll talk about that a little bit next time, but this is all I have for today. Um, again, start studying for the exam we're going to have next Friday on the 1st of May. Uh, chapters 7 through 9. And if you have any questions while you're studying, please feel free to email me. All right, take care of yourselves, be safe, and uh, you'll be hearing from me again soon.